Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful this morning that we know where our answers are? Amen. No matter what situations we face, the answer always belongs to us. It always belongs to us. Hallelujah. How many of you this morning say, just Sunday morning or last night, I received healing in my body? Raise your hand. Raise your hand real high. Raise your hand real high. We want to see it. Raise it up way up he over your head so we can see all the way to the back. Holly, look at all the hands. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost has a plan for every service. Jesus has a plan for every service, and the Holy Spirit is here to perform that plan, and we're here to cooperate with that plan. Amen. Brother Richard, we're so honored to have you here, and it means so much to us to sit under your ministry, to, I said this to him last night, and, and uh, you know, we understand that the Holy Spirit, he's the great, he's the one that does the work in us and, and among us, but I appreciate the skill this man has to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, that he doesn't go too far. He stays right in pace, and that is something that you only learn by being in that place of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, practicing with the Holy Spirit in services, and it's an example for us. So we're so grateful tonight, this morning, that you're here with us, and we are so hungry. We're reaching for more. We're interested in what God has for this service, and so come and just... Uh, all that's in your heart, we say an amen to it and we hook on with it. So give him a great big God bless you as he comes this morning. Love you. Good morning, everybody. God bless you. You may be seated. Wow, what a privilege to be here and to have an opportunity to share with you this morning. Thank God. Get out your notebooks, get out your tablets, get out your mobile phones, your smartphones, your dumb phones, whatever you have with you. I heard this story about this antique dealer who had a large shop in the city, but on weekends he would drive through the countryside to the little towns where he would look for antique bargains and hoping that the storekeeper would not know the value of some of the things he had in the little shop. And he was in one such little town looking through an antique shop when he noticed a cat was drinking milk from a bowl. And as he watched, he noticed that the bowl was not an ordinary bowl. It was a very expensive antique. And he thought to himself, this storekeeper doesn't have any idea of the value of this bowl. Why, I'll buy this bowl for little or nothing. I'll take it home, I'll sell it in my big store. And so he devised a plan and walked up to the storekeeper and said, Mr. I, I notice you have this beautiful cat. I have been wanting a cat for a long time. Would you sell me this cat? The man said, sure, mister, I'll sell you anything in my store. Just give me $100 and the cat is yours. And so he gave the man the money and stroked the cat and said, my, what a beautiful cat. I noticed that he's drinking milk from this old bowl. It's not worth much. I believe I'll just take it with me. The man said, you put that bowl down. That's the best cat seller I've ever had. <laughs> Now, do you know anybody like that? Now, everybody look straight ahead. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. Two men trying to get to one another. It's a picture of the world that we live in today. You know. I heard the story of this couple that had been married for 30 years, and it seemed like every few months as they were sleeping, she would be awakened, and she would hear a noise downstairs and send him down saying, there's a burglar in our home. Never once was there anybody in the house. Time after time, year after year, he would go downstairs and there never was anybody in the house. He got so tired of it. And after being married about 30 years, one night she, she wakened him and said, said honey, there's, there's a burglar downstairs. And he rolled his eyes 
and got up and went downstairs. And to his surprise, there was a burglar in the living room. And he put up his hands and waited till the burglar had done his thing and the burglar turned to leave. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't leave. You can't leave. Why not? Because my wife has been expecting you. You got to meet her. She's been expecting you for 30 years. (laughs) Now, what are you expecting this morning? What are you believing for? What's on your heart today? What have you been waiting? What have you been longing for? What have you set your faith out for? Are there some obstacles that have kept you from realizing what you're believing for? Well, there are some obstacles with me. I'll just be honest with you this morning. There are some obstacles and there are some things in my life that I have been working on. Removing obstacles. And there have been some things that my wife has been working on in me. Uh, to remove some obstacles. Any of you, all you men, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah. Any man who says he's boss at his house will lie about other things too, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, praise God. It's like the fellow who said, I'll watch TV wherever I want as he carried it downstairs to another room. <laughs> Oh, Lord. (laughs) Starting early. (laughs) Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, Lord, I have something else planned, Lord. Now watch out. Open your Bibles quickly. (laughs) Hmm. Open your Bibles this morning to, to, uh, where shall we turn? (laughs) Open it to Mark. Chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, (sighs) pay no attention to her over there. I have, I have, (laughs) Chloe, that's your friend, Jan. (laughs) Oh my, I am so proud to have my youngest daughter with me, Chloe Elizabeth Ann Roberts, the first. Stand up, Chloe, Let, let everybody see you. This is my daughter, Chloe. Give her a big welcome. So glad to have her with me. She travels a lot with me and was up with me in Canada just last week at a minister's conference. And I praise God for that. If you have your Bibles open to uh, Mark chapter 11, I have made so many notes. And um, I want to share what God has been dealing with me about. And I pray that it's a blessing to you. Uh, I'll use the word. We have a thing in our family where we come up with a special word every day. And uh, one of us will get the prize for having the most unusual word. So I'm, I'm taking the lead this morning. I'm, I have copious notes. <laughs> That's the word that I'm using today. I have copious notes. So I'm submitting that to my family as the word of the day, copious notes. Have you remember, any of you remember Vicki Jameson Peterson? Um, Vicki is the one, did you know Vicki? Vicki is the one who prophesied over me in 1977 that I would have a word of knowledge ministry. And uh, I didn't like Vicki. Uh, I thought she was a fake. And we were thrown together on a television program and I, I, I scooted over as far as I could away from her. We were on live television. And uh, I didn't like her. And uh, the host asked me to pray at the end of the program. and. And I prayed and then asked her to pray. And instead of praying, she prophesied over me. And what she said, there is no way she could have possibly known what was in my heart, what God had been dealing with me about. And she prophesied the word of knowledge ministry over my life. And when the program was over, we went behind uh, the the set. And I I said, Vicki, I owe you an apology. And she said, why? I said, because I don't like you. (laughs) And uh, she said, why? And I said, well, I thought you were fake. And she said, but I said, but there's no way you could have known what you prophesied, what you said was from God. And I said, I, I ask you to forgive me for what I thought of you. And uh, we, uh, we developed a friendship over the years. And I actually performed her wedding several years after that with uh, Dr. Carl uh, Peterson. But anyway, um, so I submit copious. Chloe, you have to tell mom that I, 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 I submitted copious as my word for the day, okay? 
Vicki Vicky used to call me before we did a live television show and she would say, your word for tonight is, and then she would give me a word. And I had to say it on the air. <laughs> In context. But I couldn't say, well, the word for the night is such and such. No, no, I had to say it in context so nobody knew. <laughs> but I had to say the word. And the word began to spread, and I would go on telethons on Christian networks, and they would all say, here's your word for tonight. So don't anybody try that for tonight, okay? <laughs> but I always found a way of getting the word in. So my word today is copious. Everybody say copious. copious. Bound, it means bountiful a lot. Uh, I have a lot of notes, okay? So get your notebooks out and, and your, your phones and, and get ready to make some notes. Let's, let's, let's look together at uh, Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 12. Um, I want to talk to you about getting rid of fig tree killing bitterness. Okay? Getting rid of fig tree killing bitterness and mountain moving offense. Okay? Getting rid of fig tree killing bitterness and mountain moving offense. Mark 11 verse 12, and on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. It was not yet fig season. And Jesus answered. Now, it doesn't say anybody said anything, but it says Jesus answered. Why would he say he answered? The fig tree must have been talking to him. How many of you have circumstances that are talking to you? Everybody has something that's talking to you. And it's not always positive. You get up in the morning, something's talking to you. Sometimes it's your, it's your feet or your knees or your hips. Sometimes it's your back. You get up out of, out of bed, you whoa, whoa, whoa you know, and, 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 and you start answering and you, you, you submit to the pain or you use your faith and believe God that you're going to be able to get out of bed and stand up straight. Okay? Uh, I faced that this morning because you all wore me out last night. I got a, I, the alarm clock went off this morning and I, I, I moved and I said, uh-uh, not now, not now. I'm staying right where I am for another 30 minutes. Okay. Jesus answered. So the fig tree must have said something to him. Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. All right, now this story is in two particular passages. It's in Matthew 21 and also here in Mark 11. It takes place right before Passover, which is in late March. Jesus approaches a very leafy fig tree and he finds that there are no figs. And this type of fig tree, I've done some studying on this, this type of fig tree in the Jerusalem area bears fruit with leaves starting at the end of March and bears fruit through early summer, about this time of the year, and again in the fall, particularly in October. The fig trees around Jerusalem produce fruit two times a year, in the spring and in the fall. So, there should have been figs on that tree. Now, some people, some scholars have thought that there would be figs, or that there would not be figs because it wasn't fig season, which is what I said a moment ago. But the Greek word here in this passage indicates that's not true. The Greek term in Mark eleven thirteen 13 means fully ripened figs. So when we say it was not fig season, that's not true. For the Greek says fully ripe figs. And something had happened. Something had happened to the fig tree. Now, let me take a little detour here for just a minute. And let me talk science to you. I am not a scientist. I'm like Paul Simon. Don't know much about geography. Don't know much about 
history, don't know much about <laughs> science books, don't know much about the French I took. Some of you know that song, some of you don't. Remember, but I do know that I love you. <laughs> you remember the rest of that song. And I know that if you love me too, what a wonderful world. I see some of you mouthing the words with me. Some of them are as old as me, Nancy. Uh, uh, but let, let's, talk about, let's talk about science for a minute. If you talk to anybody that knows anything about figs or farmers, you'll find that there are three required balanced nutrients. Now, this is not just true for figs, but it's really true for anything that grows. There are three things that you've got to have in the soil. You've got to have nitrogen, you've got to have phosphorus, and you've got to have potassium. Without those three things, ain't nothing going to grow. Okay? All right? The nitrogen makes it possible for the tree to produce healthy green colored leaves. The phosphorus makes it possible for the tree to fight disease and form new roots and make seeds and produce fruit and flowers. The potassium makes it possible for the tree to grow faster and make the stems stronger. Now in modern times, when there is an imbalance, they use fertilizer. But in those days, they did not have fertilizer to use. And if someone who grows fig trees uh, were to hear this question, uh, they would say that the common reason figs don't bear fruit and the, the figs themselves in season is because the soil has too much nitrogen. This is a scientific fact. And the sure symptom, the sure symptom of this is an abundance in the growth of leaves, but no fruit on the tree. That is a sure sign of too much nitrogen in the soil. And what it means is that the tree will eventually die. Now, there are some scholars who believe that the fig tree that Jesus encountered was a wild fig tree. And he cursed it, only accelerating what was about to happen anyway. This tree was bound to die because it was fig season and had not produced any fruit. Uh, just like the parable of the sower that Jesus talks about in Matthew 13 and, and Mark 4 and in Luke 8, the problem here is the condition of the soil. Now let's get a little bit more personal. The problem here is the condition of the heart. It's the condition of our hearts. Our hearts get us into trouble because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. If you slam your finger in your car door, you will say something. It'll come up right out of your heart. Whatever is in your heart usually comes out of your mouth. And sometimes you say it before you realize what you have said. Since a tree farmer during the life of Jesus did not have modern fertilizer like today to balance the nutrients. There were two main ways, two main things that they did to bring balance back to the nitrogen and the soil. And this is absolutely amazing. The first thing they did in those days was they added wood chips and sawdust and the second thing they did was they watered it because water leaches out the excess nitrogen. They added wood and they added water. This is a scientific fact. And it is most amazing to us today. Let's read on. In verse 20, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter Calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed yesterday is withered away. 
And Jesus answered and said to him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, this problem, this need, this obstacle, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Now, Matthew 21 doesn't add the line, shall not doubt in his heart. Most scholars believe that Peter joined Mark in writing the gospel of Mark. And Mark adds a phrase that, that, Mark, that Matthew 21 doesn't have. And that is, shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now that's the scripture that Lindsay and I stood on after Vicki Jameson gave that prophecy over me. That's the scripture that we prayed on. We called in a healing ministry. It took several years for it to happen. But we refused to get weary in our well-doing. We held on and we held on and we held on and we held on until people began getting healed. And God fulfilled that scripture. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. We didn't have a healing ministry, but by faith we had it. And we just kept believing. We didn't announce it on television. We didn't tell anybody. We just held on to it until it was manifested. And it's been manifesting itself ever since. Amen. And I praise God for that. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, Matthew, in his gospel, focuses this story on mountain moving faith. And that ends his account. But Mark adds the phrase or adds a condition. And that is not Doubting in your heart. The Greek word here for doubt is not being uncertain, but concerns your heart having an obstacle to your faith. And this is a preface to verse 25 where Jesus spells out what the obstacle is. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you. I submit to you this morning that in many cases, the obstacle is not the obstacle that we think it is. We are the obstacle. It's like that man who said, I have seen the enemy and the enemy is me. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Amen. We are the obstacle. We're focusing our attention on obstacles that are out there. Yeah. Uh -huh. When we are the obstacle. When we have refused to forgive. Yeah. And without forgiving, you can just toss away the rest of that scripture. What were you saying this morning about that in the car? You were talking about how a person can be anointed, but if the, if the audience, if the crowd doesn't, doesn't join in, then there's not much he could do. And that's verified by Jesus who went places where he could do no mighty miracles because of their unbelief. And it doesn't, how, it doesn't matter how much I'm anointed or how much you're anointed if the people that you're with aren't taking it in. If God doesn't show us how to get that word into them, then it'll be of no effect. And we'll be just spinning our wheels and we'll go home miserable. But in many cases, we are the obstacle. I was preaching for Jack Hayford years ago in, in Los Angeles and uh, had a healing service just like last night. People came forward, a big lineup of people. They were testifying and a man came up and said, I, I got healed of a speck in my eye. And I'd never heard anybody say that before. I'd read it in the Bible, but I, I, I didn't know about a speck. And I said, what do you mean a speck in your eye? He said, well, really, it was more like a board. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Now, there's a big crowd and big line of people. He said, well, you're the board. I said, what do you mean? Are you saying I'm boring? He said, no. He said, I've had a board in my eye because I don't like you. He said, my wife forced me to come to this service tonight. 
And as you were praying and I saw people being healed, the Lord showed me that I had a board in my eye that I was the problem. And he said, God healed me and I'm up here to testify it publicly and to ask you to forgive me for what I have held against you. Well, I never even met the man. I didn't know him and yet he was holding an offense against me which was keeping him from doing what he was called to do. So many times we are the problem. We're looking for the problem. We're trying to figure out what the problem is when the problem is here because we're looking out there. When the problem's right here. Lindsay and I were watching television one night, this years ago, and we were watching a Christian station and a man was preaching and Lindsay and I were just kind of talking back and forth. You know how you do, you have the TV on for background noise. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and all of a sudden I heard the man say my name. So what did I do? I got the remote and I turned the volume up. Because <laughs> you always want to hear what somebody says about you, you know, you know, curiosity killed the cat, you know. So, so I turned it up and he was talking about me. And much to my amazement, what he was saying about me wasn't true. And the more he talked, the angrier I got. And I kept saying, Lindsay, that, that's not right. That's not true. And he'd say something else. That's not true. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I, I, I started, you know how you do, you, I was just, he's not, that's not right. That's not right. And that's not right. And that's not right. <laughs> Now, don't look at me so sanctimonious. <laughs> you know what it's like to double up your fist, you know? I've often wished that I could get a license to kill one person a year. <laughs> now, don't look at me that way. You've thought the same thing. You know somebody right now that needs to die. Every one of you, you know somebody. Yes. You got their name on your lips right now. You know they need to die. More than one. That it would be a blessing to the whole world if they just dropped dead. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. And the more I thought about what this man said, it just, it just made me so angry because he was lying. And he was doing it on television. And people are so gullible, they believe anything. Yeah. Yeah. Now, stories out there, not a word of truth in it. It just, it just hurt me to my heart. And I got so angry and so upset, and time passed, and every time I thought about him, just, you know, just, well, a few months passed, and I was invited to come on a television program. I flew out uh, to, to be on when I got there. To my amazement, this man was there. <laughs> this one's just for the hospital. This one is certain death. Because I'm left-handed. We're going to settle this thing today. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, I didn't curse, but wherever I spit, the grass died, I'm telling you that. <laughs> and we went back to the little green room, the little waiting room they had behind the set, waiting to go on as guests. And he was standing with a group of people, and he was joking, and he was laughing, and I was getting angrier by the minute. When the Lord spoke to me and said, go over there and ask him to forgive you, I said, for what? I didn't do anything to him. The second time the Lord said, go over there and ask him to forgive you. I said, you go over there. You ask him to forgive you. Third time, go over there and ask him to forgive you. Well, okay. And I walked over to him and I said, Bill, I owe you an apology. He said, why? I said, because I've been harboring unforgiveness in my heart about you. And God has shown me that I'm wrong. And from the bottom of my heart, I repent. And I ask you to forgive me. Big tears began to run down his face. I'll never forget it. 
He said to me, Richard, some time ago I said some things about you on television that I have learned are not true. And I'm on this program today, I'm going to correct it on national television. Tears are running down my face. And he and I embraced. And there was a healing. And he and I became friends for 20 years until he went home to be with the Lord. Something about forgiveness, my friend. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It won't do anything to them, but it'll kill you. Now, I found this online. This is from Johns Hopkins University in, in Baltimore, which is one of the most prestigious hospitals in America. Forgiveness, your health depends upon it. Conflict doesn't just weigh down the spirit, it can lead to physical health issues. But these steps from a Johns Hopkins expert can help you move toward forgiveness and better health. Now this article is from Dr. Karen Schwartz, who is a Jewish MD at Johns Hopkins. Whether it is a simple spat with your spouse or long-held resentment toward a family member or friend, unresolved conflict can go deeper than you may realize. It may be affecting your physical health. The good news, studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of heart attacks, improving cholesterol levels, and helping you sleep reducing pain and lowering blood pressure, as well as levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. And research points to an increase in the forgiveness health connection as you age. This is an enormous physical burden, or there is, excuse me, there is an enormous physical burden to being hurt and disappointed, says Dr. Schwartz who is the director of the Mood Disorders Adult Consultation Clinic. That is a mouthful. <laughs> At Johns Hopkins Hospital. Chronic anger puts you into a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. Those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, and diabetes among other conditions. Forgiveness, however, calms stress levels leading to improved health. Forgiveness is not just about saying the words. It is an active process in which you make a conscious decision to let the negative feelings go, whether the person deserves it or not. As you release the anger, Dr. Schwartz says, resentment and hostility, you begin to feel empathy, compassion, and sometimes even affection toward the person who has done you wrong. I can see Jesus hanging on the tree with a smile on his face as he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. There is such healing in forgiveness. And unforgiveness may be the biggest obstacle in people's lives. It will tear you up on the inside. And Matthew 18, verse 35 says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not, every one of, of the brother, your brothers for their trespasses. Well, there's that word heart again. Our heart is like the soil out of which everything grows. Why do we wear a breastplate of righteousness? To protect our hearts. For with the heart man believes, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Just like the fig tree, if our heart, the soil, is out of balance, 
with bitterness and unforgiveness, then growth in our lives will be premature and unhealthy or we will have no growth at all, just like the fig tree. And what will happen to us? We will wither up and die. Dr. James Winslow, a longtime friend, orthopedic surgeon, once said to me, Richard, in my medical practice, in my surgical practice, the biggest thing I have to deal with in people's lives is unforgiveness before the surgery. Wow. He said, if I can get to the root of the unforgiveness, my surgery has a much better opportunity of working. Now, this is an orthopedic surgery who deals with knees and hips and ankles and elbows and things like that. And he, he showed me a diagram and he gave me an illustration. He said, when a person gets into unforgiveness and bitterness, they turn inward on themselves. And he did it physically like this and he showed me what it does to your body. It just turns you in. He said, no wonder so many people have these type of ailments. And he said, if I can deal with the unforgiveness and the bitterness, my surgery has a lot better chance of being successful. How do you get your heart back in balance? Well, let's go back to science. How do you get the nitrogen level balanced? They used wood chips and they used water. Well, the wood chips represents the cross. What Jesus did when he went to the cross. And I know that there are those today who don't want to talk about the cross. They don't want to talk about the shed blood. You remember, I'm sure, some years ago, the film, uh, The Passion, that Mel Gibson made. Well, the executive producer uh, 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 is a man by the name of Jeff Finholt. You all may know who Jeff is. Jeff was the lead singer uh, of, uh, of a number of rock groups before he gave his heart to the Lord and did the role of Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway, which was just recently revived on television. Had a huge audience. And uh, I was watching it that night. It was live. It was a live performance. Some of you may have seen it. And, and I love the fact that, that Alice Cooper was in it. And Alice is a strange name for a man, uh, but uh, uh, Alice is a born-again Christian, and he's playing the devil. <laughs> uh, it, it's amazing. Well, Jeff Finholt uh, called me the other day, and uh, Warner Brothers is negotiating right now with Mel Gibson for The Passion 2. And Jeff's going to be the executive producer, and they're, they're, they're hiring Jim Caviezel, who played the part of Jesus, who is a born-again Christian to reprise that role and to take it from, from the tomb. From, you remember how that movie ended with those big holes in his hand, remember that? He's gonna take it forward. And Jeff was telling me about it and he said, he said pray with me because we're, we're in negotiations and you never know how the negotiations are gonna turn out. You know, you're talking about multi, multi millions of dollars. That movie I think grossed something like $600 million worldwide. But they're, they're, there was a word of prophecy given by my longtime friend Hank Kuhneman, who pastors in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Some of you may know Pastor Hank and Brenda Kuhneman. And Hank said, told me several years ago, Richard, uh, the Christian world has done a horrible job at producing Christian films. They're just rinky-dink. And the main reason is because they don't have the finances to do what Hollywood can do. And he said, God is going to use Hollywood to bring forth the gospel in their movies. Well, we saw what Roma Downey did a few years ago with the, with the Bible and how many people gave their hearts to Christ and how many people gave their hearts to Christ during the, the Passion movie. Uh, Chloe, and Chloe, you were about 13 or 14, I guess, when we, you and I went to see it. We, we couldn't stop crying. We just, it was unbelievable. The passion in that film and what it displayed. And it, it showed you a, a, a very dramatic picture of what probably really happened and what he went through to bear our sin and shame and the stripes on his back for our healing. I, I saw Jim Caviezel on The Tonight Show uh, after that film was made and produced and he told the story. He said, when we got to the scene where I, where I as Jesus was at the hitching post and they were striping my back, 
He said they used, they used a real whip. He said, he said what the audience couldn't see was I had a board on my back. And he was striking the board to make it realistic. He said, but he, one time he missed the board. And he said he tore a huge hunk out of my back. And he said, I've never experienced pain like that in my life. And uh, he was on with, I think it was when Jay Leno was hosting. And he, he, he looked and he said, can you imagine 38 more times? And he said, we had to stop filming that day because it ripped my back apart. Well, they're getting ready to hopefully uh, to, to sign a deal to, to make The Passion 2 with Mel Gibson again. And he was the producer of it. But they mixed wood, chips, or sawdust. That's why we must preach the cross. And what Jesus did, what it signifies, we must never stop talking about the cross. The cross is a central part in our lives. But we, all must, but we must also go beyond that. We must talk about the washing of the water with the word. That is extremely, extremely critical for getting back into balance. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, having, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. With our hearts balanced by holding on to the redemption of the cross, we know following his example that we can be free from bitterness and have healthy growth in Christ Jesus instead of being stunted and withering away by harboring unforgiveness. Amen. Now, there are those of you here this morning that might not have been aware until you heard me this morning that there is still a little unforgiveness in you about somebody. And this is something that I have to check on every day because just about every day in my life, I have a chance to be offended. Some yahoo on the freeway cut you off, you know, and we're in California now, you know, <laughs> California, they don't wave with one hand, they wave with one finger. <laughs> and you know the finger that I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. It's a different kind of wave. <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, when they do that, you have a tendency to yell something back. At least I'm honest enough to admit it. <clears throat> You know, you're praying in tongues, uh, you're driving your car, you stupid. Uh, don't look at me like that, you know. But if you want to grow, if you want to reach out to what God has for you, then the obstacle may be you. We may be the obstacle. It's not because of what somebody else did or didn't do. It's not because of some big faith project out there that we just haven't gotten a hold of yet. It's not because something hadn't sold. The obstacle could very well be us. So what did David do when this circumstance happened? He said, search me, O oh God. See if there's anything in me. Now when he said anything, that would include unforgiveness. Imagine, imagine David having to forgive Saul for chasing him for all those years. And he had a good chance to kill him once and didn't do it. And told him, I, I could have killed you. But he didn't do it because he wouldn't touch a person who had had, even though it was a farmer anointing, he wouldn't touch him. But David said, search me, O God, see if there's anything in me 
that is not of you. And that's something that I've got to do every day of my life because every day I have an opportunity to be offended. Every day things come against me. Every day people come against me. Every day somebody is doing something or saying something that I have an opportunity to be offended by. Offense comes so easily. And if we hold on to that offense and we talk about it and we foster it and we feed it, pretty soon it is huge. And that may be the reason why Jesus could not do many miracles in some places because they were so offended that he would say, today this scripture is fulfilled in your midst. They got so offended that he could do no miracles except he laid hands on a few and they were healed. So I want you to just bow your head for a moment. I want you to just think for a moment. I, I promise you, if there's something or someone like I'm describing, the Holy Spirit will bring that person to your remembrance right now. Because the Holy Spirit is really good at digging down deep where you live in your solar plexus area and drawing up those things down there for which you don't know how to get out and take them up to God in an intercessory prayer so that when we tap into the Holy Spirit's prayer, we can join in and then stop after that and pray in our own language. And we can get cleansing and we can get healing and we can get forgiveness and we can get God's touch upon our lives. So I want you to just bow your head for a moment and just allow the Holy Spirit to bring that thing. Now, perhaps there is nothing, but perhaps there is. And for some of you, there may be something there or there may be somebody. It seems like every day of my life, I'm having to forgive somebody. I'm having to forgive them for something that they did or something that they said. Just the other day, I, I, had, to, I had to forgive somebody. I, was, I, I got angry, and when I realized it, I had to say, no, I'm not going to do that, God. I'm going to forgive them right now. I'm going to let them go. I want you to think about that person for just a moment. And then I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and we're going to let them go. We're going to let them grow so fruit can once again abound in your life. And then after that, we're going to take the next step. Now, have you, got, have you got that person in mind or that situation in mind? You got that obstacle in mind? Do you? All right. Then let's pray and let's pray out loud. Father, I come to you today not in my name, not in my strength, but in the name of Jesus. This obstacle is out there. This person, this person, this situation, this situation. and I've held it against them, and I'm sorry. I repent. I forgive them. I let them go. I give them to you. I can't handle them. If I could, I would have already handled them. But because I can't handle them, I give them to you. I forgive them. I let them go in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody just began to praise him this morning. Now that's a healing right there. That's a healing. That's a healing in people's lives. And if you'll practice that every day, all these things that Dr. Schwartz talked about begin to go down. And there'll be peace, and there'll be rest, and there'll be sleep, and there'll be a calmness, and you won't be so irritable or upset you realize that people are people. Someone is going to cut you off on the street today. I promise you, this is California. It's going to happen. Right out here on the 15, they're going to cut you off. I promise you. And if you go to the 91, it's worse. 
because 91 is the worst freeway that the Lord ever allowed to be built. Just ask anybody. They'll tell you the 91 is the worst. There are more wrecks on the 91 than any other freeway in the greater Los Angeles area. But there's no other way to get through that pass. Take your life in your hands driving through there. But if you do this on a daily basis, just like you brush your teeth every day, you do it every day and keep that cleansed. You'll sleep better. You'll rest better. Cholesterol level goes down. Blood pressure level goes down. Risk of heart attack goes down. God is so smart. And it's amazing that these doctors are sometimes so much smarter than we are. Because they do long-term studies and they see how these things work in people's lives. All right, now let's, let's brad the nail on the other side this morning, okay? We've dealt with unforgiveness. Is that a fair thing? Have we done that? Yeah. Now let's deal on the other side. Let's deal for just a few moments with hope. Hope. And Jesus is our blessed hope. I was preaching uh, the other Saturday night on uh, a, a live phone call. Every Saturday night I do a live telephone conference call. It's at uh, 10 o'clock Central Time where I live, but it's 8 o'clock out here. So when we arrived, when Chloe and, and Dr. Ogle and I arrived on Saturday, we got to the hotel around 7. And so the first thing I had to do uh, was I had, a, I had a phone call. I had about 690 people on a live phone call Saturday night. And the Lord had given me a word about hope. And I preached on it uh, Saturday night, but I've not preached on it since. So you are going to be my guinea pig this morning. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you some things about hope. Now that we have forgiven, now that we have let that go, the offense go, and we're ready now for new growth, now let's talk about hope, and let's talk about how hope can bring change, how hope can bring healing to our lives. And let me give you nine reasons to hope. You might want to write these down because I think they will brad the nail on the other side after we have forgiven. Here is what hope does, because you have to have hope. Without hope, you are helpless. And hope is tremendous. Hope, number one, helps us to move forward. The more we long for the future, the less we will yearn for the past. Hope removes regret and focuses upon expectation. It literally increases your momentum. Hope is incredibly valuable to each one of us. Second, hope energizes the present. Your life and my life is worth living because of the eternal God and his plan for us. Jeremiah tells us that his plan for us is good. Three, hope lightens our darkness. Hope does not deny the reality of what has happened. Hope doesn't sweep it under the carpet. Hope doesn't say, this didn't happen. Hope doesn't say this person did not do this bad thing. However, it does shine a bright light and point you to the sunrise. Like the song from that Broadway musical, the sun will come out tomorrow. Number four, hope increases faith. Now the disciples came to Jesus one day and said, increase our faith. They knew something that many of us don't know. It must be possible to have our faith, which we were born with, increased. Because they said, Jesus, increase our faith. Our faith can be increased. We can believe more. We can believe better. Or else the disciples wouldn't have asked the question. Hope increases faith. Faith fuels hope. But hope also fuels faith. There is a reciprocity. 
That's my second word for the day. My, there is a divine reciprocity, a coming together of faith and hope. They are tied together. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith and hope are very closely tied together. One builds upon the other. Without faith, we cannot soar with hope. But without faith, or excuse me, without hope, faith will die. And the greatest believers are the greatest hopers. Number five, hope is infectious. It spreads. You get somebody in the room that's hopeful, and pretty soon people standing around them be hopeful too. Because it's, 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 like it's like an infectious disease. It spreads. Hope spreads. It spreads. It inspires and it motivates. Not only encouraging others, but it also impacts depressed unbelievers who cannot help but ask the reason that you have such hope and gives you an opportunity to be a witness. Number six, hope is healing. It doesn't just bring healing, it is healing. And by definition, depression is a sense of hopelessness. That things cannot and will not get better. But our hope tells us things will get better. There is a way out. And there are things that we can do to help that to happen. It's like the story of the man who had been drinking and took a shortcut through a cemetery and fell into an open grave. And he desperately tried to claw his way out, but it had been raining. And the dirt had turned to mud and he couldn't claw his way out. And so he sat in the darkness in the grave waiting for morning for someone to fish him out. As luck would have it, another man who had also been drinking <laughs> took the same shortcut through the same cemetery and fell into the other end of the same grave. He too tried to claw his way out. When from the darkness he heard a voice, you'll never get out, but he did. <laughs> It's amazing what you can do under the anointing. <laughs> hope. Everybody say hope. hope. It's healing. It's a huge step toward healing. Number seven, hope is practical. Hope does not mean we're just going to sit around and wait. Hope has action. Hope motivates you to move into action. It gets us into prayer, confessing and believing for our miracle. It gets us into calling that which is not as though it is. So hope has a practicality, a practicalness to it. Number eight, hope stabilizes us in the midst of the storm. Now, most Christians that I know are either going through a storm or they have just come out of a storm or they're about to go into another storm. You say, well, that's sort of negative. No, it's not negative at all. It's the truth. But hope stabilizes us into the storm. I read a story online that in the, in the days of, uh, after the death, burial, and resurrection of, of Jesus, when, when Christianity was beginning to spread and Peter and Paul and the others were preaching and the Roman government uh, sought to persecute the Christians primarily under the emperor Nero, that there were caves that the, many of the Christians lived in and, and worshiped in. And in those caves there were, there were drawings and they drew things on those, on those caves. Uh, they drew uh, they, they drew uh, in, in, the, in those tunnels, uh, they drew an pictures of anchors. And they drew 60, they found 66 pictures, 66 drawings of anchors in those catacombs. I've been in those catacombs in Rome. I went down in there. And it's amazing to me that they, that they, they, draw, they drew anchors, which was symbolic of Jesus, who is their anchor, was their anchor of faith. When Paul stood on the storm-washed deck of the, of the, of the wind-battered uh, ship 
there on the Mediterranean when they had seen neither sun nor stars for two weeks. He said to them, be of good cheer, for an angel stood beside me and told me that none of us will die. We're going to lose the cargo. But if we stay together, no one will perish. There were some 270 plus of them on that ship. We've got to come together. Jesus told them to, to go to an upper room and to tarry and to come together, come into one accord. I don't know how long it took them. If they're typical Christians, it took a long time for them to come together because they had to dissect each other's theology, I'm sure. Because I don't cross my T or dot my I the way you do, then I'm cast out. You know, that's the way many Christians are. But we've got to come together. He, Paul stabilized them in the midst of that storm and they had a faith landing. They landed on the island of Malta, of Melita in those days, Malta now. And Malta, uh, by definition today, is the, considered the most Christianized nation in the world per capita. They still celebrate St. Paul's Day on Malta. Uh, there, there are, per capita, there are more Christians in Malta than any other nation on earth because of what the Apostle Paul did while he was there. So hope stabilizes us in the middle of the storm. And then finally, hope defends. Paul depicts hope as a defensive helmet. The helmet of salvation. The first piece of the sevenfold armor is the helmet. The helmet of salvation. Why? Because your mind is the battlefield of the devil. And we put on a defensive helmet to protect our mind from the tricks and the strategies that Satan would try to pull against us. Our minds are so valuable. Joyce Meyer calls your mind the battlefield of, of, of the devil. And Paul depicts hope as a helmet that we put on the whole armor of God and it begins with the helmet of salvation to protect our mind. Then we put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts. For with the heart man believes and with confession and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. A helmet, a breastplate, a belt of truth. For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Gospel shoes yeah. to walk over the devil's roughest territory. Yeah. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the Bible. Yeah. The shield of faith by which we're able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Right. And praying in tongues, the seventh piece. Praying always in the spirit. Yeah. These things have marked my life and are marking my life on a daily basis. And when I let go of offenses... When I let go of those things and those people who inevitably do things against me and I don't hold it to their account, healing comes into my life. My wife gave me the, the greatest example. She said, you have every reason to be unforgiving, but you have no right. You have every reason. And then she got out a piece of paper and she said, write down the names of the people who have offended you on the left side, draw a line and put down on the other side what they've done. She said, after I did that, she said, now tear the paper in half this way. Separate them from what they did. She said, you don't have to forgive what they did, but you have to forgive them telling you, it will set you free. And when you get back to your churches, pastors, teach this, preach it. There's no copyright on it. I donate it to you. Okay? Truth is truth, no matter where you find it. <laughs> you know, I heard a guy, uh, he was always, he, he would say, well, I, I heard I heard this person preach this message. They preached it the second time. Well, the Holy Spirit showed this to me. You know, 
the divine revelation the next time they preached it. <laughs> but whoever it is, he got it from somewhere. <laughs> so there's no, there's no copyright, no copyright on truth. Just take it, use it, preach it, minister to the needs of the people. Be a blessing. Praise God. Let's stand together. Did you get something this morning? What'd you hear? What, what did you hear this morning? What'd you get? I'm reverting, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reverting to my dad. My dad used to, used to do this. He'd finish a message like this. He'd have a teaching session. And then he, he'd go through the crowd and have people tell him uh, what, what, what they got. What they got out of the message. He said, Richard, it brads the nail. Craig, what what would you, what, what'd you get this morning? What'd you hear? What'd you hear? About hope and forgiveness. Did it get inside you? Did it get inside you? Can you take this and preach it up in Canada? I will. Don't give me any credit for it. You know? What did you hear this morning? What, what, what did the Lord say to you? Not to be an obstacle to my own growth. Not to be an obstacle to my own growth. That's good. What did you hear this morning? Basically the obstacle that I am the that obstacle. I'm the obstacle. Yes. I have found the enemy and it's me. Yes. <laughs> what did you hear this morning? Have to forgive. What'd you hear? Forgive everyone that I have healed. Forgive everyone that what? That has offended me. So that, that has offended you. So that I have healed. So that you get healing. Hallelujah. It's good. What, what'd you What'd you hear this morning? What'd you hear? What, what happened to you when you What'd you hear? Me? Yeah. Uh, I am the problem. I am the problem. <laughs> and Jesus is the answer. And Jesus is the answer. That's right. That's good. Yeah. Pastor Nancy, what'd you hear? What'd you hear? Yeah. Uh, forgiveness will accelerate. Forgiveness will accelerate my faith, she said. What'd you, what'd you hear? You heard glory. <laughs> Don't drink the poison. That's good, isn't it? What, what'd you hear? Unforgiveness will stop my growth. Isn't that good? It just kind of brads it on the other side of the nail. Praise God. Let's, let's lift our hands unto the Lord this morning. Father, we praise you, we give you honor, and we give you glory. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, for your tender, loving kindness that you care. You care for us. Just like the Apostle Paul spoke to the church of Philippi and said, thank God your care for me has flourished. You care for us. Your care for us as your children is flourishing. And we feel your presence. We feel you this morning. We feel you. And we praise you this morning. And we take every word of this. Lord, thank you that it is re-emphasized in my life today. So that all throughout this day, I'm able to forgive. I'm able to let it go. And give it to God. Thank you, Father, that because of it, my heart will beat stronger. My blood pressure will be lower. My cholesterol level will be reduced in spite of eating barbecue. I'll sleep better. I'll rest better. I'll have a healthier attitude. I'll be a kinder person. I'll listen more. And I'll preach shorter and minister longer. <laughs> in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Give the Lord a great shout of praise. Pastor.